Latinos and Hispanics about LGBT equality. The first speaker is Dave Montes, who is Senior Program Officer at Gill Foundation and is responsible for designing and implementing the Gill Foundation's national strategy to build alliances between LGBT and Latino groups. The second speaker is Shan Lund, who is Messaging Strategist at the Movement Advancement Project, sometimes called MAP, and works in LGBT movement messaging and communications more generally. The third speaker is Monica Trasandes, who is Director of Spanish Language Media at Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, otherwise known as GLAD. And uh, I'll turn the uh, mic, I guess, over to Dave, who will open uh, the forum. Dave? Thank you, Francis. Um, welcome, everyone, to the webinar. <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in, and I apologize. Um, I've got a bit of a cold, so if I have to clear my throat, I really apologize. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit at first about um, how this project got started. I mean, there was a lot of um, talk and um, effort that went into this project before we started doing any of the research itself. Um, the Gill Foundation had um, decided to launch what we call the Latino Initiative, which is designed to build and leverage alliances between the LGBT and Latino communities, specifically LGBT and Latino organizations. Um, and so we had had, we have um, an African American initiative and we've had the African American initiative uh, for several years. Um, and this was sort of an expansion of um, what we had learned through the African American initiative as well as our progressive funding within Colorado, which is where we're based. Um, so the first step was um, having conversations with LGBT leaders, Latino leaders, LGBT Latino leaders. Um, who were doing um, this alliance building work throughout the country. Um, and as I started conversations with all of these leaders, I, there were two questions that kept, kept coming up over and over again. The first was, what are you guys doing on immigration? Um, and the second was, how do you talk to Latinos about LGBT issues? I, I mean, if I were to, we heard from uh, especially our straight allied leaders, if I were to go into a room full of Latinos, who frankly don't really talk about this very often and start using messages that the LGBT movement has developed, um, even if they were translated into Spanish, I'd probably get a lot of blank stares. And so um, the first thing we did was start funding immigration work outside of Colorado. We had been doing immigration funding in Colorado for a while. Um, and the second thing we did was start to have conversations with people about, okay, well, if we were going to do a research and messaging project, who would we work with? Um, who has expertise in this arena? Um, and so um, the first thing we kept hearing from people was, or we kept hearing over and over again, you really need to work with Ben Dixon and Amani International in Miami. Um, Sergio Ben Dixon and his team have done um, uh, work with Latinos and messaging to Latinos for years and years. They did Barack Obama's work. They did Hillary Clinton's work. Um, they do a lot of work for corpor uh, Fortune 500 corporations. Um, you really need to talk to Sergio Ben Dixon. So we started having a conversation with Ben Dixon and Amandi, um, and we realized early in that we really needed to bring in an LGBT perspective as well. So we partnered with um, the folks at the Movement Advancement Project and also uh, the folks at GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. So we decided, since we were going to be investing a lot of money into this project, that we would do more than just figure out how to talk to Latinos, that we would use about LGBT issues, that we would actually use this project to help set the strategy for the Latino initiative, since it was one of the first things we were doing. So. We kept hearing conflicting beliefs, um, which is all they were at that point. There was not a lot of research to back it up, that, um, that religion was a major, major uh, contributor to how um, uh, LGBT Latinos feel about LGBT issues, especially Catholicism, um, because the Catholic Church had um, gone so far out um, against a lot of LGBT issues and um, specifically marriage, people felt that religion was a major factor in the way that LGBT, um, the way that Latinos would feel about LGBT issues. So we decided to figure it out, see how much influence it really had. 
and also um, we had we heard from a lot of the people we talked to, and we heard from Ben, um, ben Dixon and Amandi staff that that because Latinos are familiar with discrimination, that discrimination um, against LGBT people and LGBT Latinos might be a way to start a conversation with Latinos about LGBT issues. Um, and so uh, we originally started with really trying to develop a framework for deeper discussions across a variety of LGBT issues. But what you'll see later um, in the presentation is that Latinos were already, are already largely supportive of a wide variety of LGBT issues, including non-discrimination protections, safe schools protections, open military service. But where we saw um, a little bit of a decline um, was around relationship recognition um, and adoption. And so we decided to focus the second part of the research study or the later parts of the research study on relationship recognition. Um, so when we met with Ben Dixon and Amandi, uh, when we you know, decided we were going to move forward, um, we asked them to help us figure out what the research project would look like. Um, and so we did um, a series of focus groups to begin with to really just figure out how Latinos were talking about LGBT issues. If you were to say to them, what do you think of marriage? What do you think of non-discrimination protections? Um, and just let them talk to really figure out how they were talking about these issues amongst, them, amongst themselves. Um, we did a lot in Spanish. There was some uh, research that had already been done on English-dominant Latinos. And so we decided to, do, um, to focus a lot of this research project on Spanish-dominant Latinos and um, bilingual um, English and Spanish. Um, and then we did a telephone survey um, in the five, state, uh, five states being um, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, California, and North Carolina, um, which is where we had done the focus groups, um, to get a baseline read on where Latinos are or were then on um, LGBT issues. So with that, I will turn it over to Monica um, to give us sort of an a analysis of the project. Hi folks, this is Monica Bresandes at GLAD. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Dave. So I'll now go, I'll now go through some of the, uh, the key findings. Let me just... Oops. The first finding is that Latinos and Catholics in particular tend to be strongly supportive across a wide range of LGBT equality issues. Um, secondly, in focus groups and discussions, we saw that persuasive conversations tended to center on four key themes, family, respect, faith, and opposition to discrimination. Third, we found that focusing on shared values of family and fairness was really effective in terms of having conversations about marriage. It was important to offer folks a really concrete sense of, of how denial of marriage hurts gay and lesbian couples and their families. And fourth, we saw that while there was strong empathy for the experiences of gay people among the participants, it was really better to avoid direct comparisons between LGBT equality and immigration rights. Now let's look a little more in depth at those four themes that I mentioned that really sort of stood out as uh, the important building, building block to that support that we saw. The first is family. Now, family is important to Latinos. We all know that, right? We often live close to our families. We talk with them regularly, and we rely on them in important ways. As more folks come out, more and more Latino families now have an openly gay person within that family. So it makes sense that emphasizing the importance of family acceptance and family unity really was helpful in terms of building common ground. In fact, a lot of times when we spoke to people in focus groups, even those who were not that supportive, they were very critical of anyone who had disowned a gay family member. They would say things like, you know, you don't turn your back on family no matter what. Um, so that was something we often heard in terms of why the, a, a person felt they, could, they supported uh, gay people on issues. The second issue, um, the second theme was respect. Now, respect is a theme that we heard again oftentimes. People said, hay que respetar in terms of, of respecting the rights of others. 
It's important to note, too, that when we heard respect as, an, as a theme that folks mentioned, they often talked about it as a communal value, as in I believe in respecting others, um, as opposed to an individual one. It wasn't so much I deserve respect, but I believe in respecting others. Now let's look a little bit at some of the um, specific findings that, uh, in, that um, led us to, to feel the, the strong support that we have. When we asked folks, is being gay morally acceptable, 55% of them said yes. And we saw even stronger support among Catholics, where we saw 68% of Catholics said that homosexuality is morally acceptable. So it's probably not surprising that faith is one of the other issues that was important to folks, another important theme. We found that faith actually did not negatively influence how participants felt about gay people and issues. In fact, it may even be a foundation for support. We often heard people say that the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you was important to them. 79% of Latino Catholics said that a person can support gay rights and still be a good Catholic. And we often heard in focus groups that people didn't feel it was sort of an either-or choice. They said to us, you know, it's not I'm either a good Catholic or I support. I can do both. And then when we pushed them a little bit on this, they said that, look, we look at this from a human perspective as opposed to a strictly religious point of view. Um, opposition to discrimination was another important theme. Um, a lot of folks said it was inherently unfair to treat another group of people differently. And um, while there was a strong feeling, what was interesting is that while there was a strong feeling that there was discrimination, a lot of folks said, well, there must already be protections in place uh, to protect gay people from discrimination. So a lot of times we had to explain that, no, there are not protections. You can still be fired. You can still be kicked out of your home, uh, your apartment, or your dwelling for being gay. So it was important, we found, to really use personal stories that can illustrate for folks the concrete harms of discrimination. So let's look at some of those specific findings on discrimination now. When we asked how often do you think discrimination um, occurs against gay and lesbian people, 48% said very often and 32% said somewhat often. Even um, Then when we asked about discrimination, about passing laws that protect people from discrimination, 83% of those that we queried said that they agreed that laws should be passed. When we asked about military service, 73% of those we queried said that they thought that gay people should be able to serve openly in the military. And 75% of those we asked said that they, they supported some form of prevention against bullying within the schools. And now I am going to pass it to Sean so that he can tell you a little bit more about marriage specifically. Wonderful. Thanks, Monica. This is Sean Lund from the Movement Advancement Project. So. Um, Okay, great. Thank you. I've, I've got it. So basically, um, the next section of this, in addition to kind of taking a look at some of the larger themes and some of the public opinion data on Latino and, and Hispanic support for a broader range of LGBT issues, we also took kind of a deep dive into marriage, knowing how important the issue and how prominent the issue has, 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 has become um, ac across the country. Um, and so we kind of started with kind of trying to, you know, over the course of the focus groups and the Dixon and Amandi's um, poll, to take a look at what we call kind of Latino and Hispanic mindset on marriage or kind of basically kind of our, our starting point. And what we saw is um, something very similar to what, what, what we see in the U.S. population as a whole, which is that um, Latinos and Hispanics are closely divided on allowing same-sex couples to marry, but that they are becoming more supportive over time and, frankly, very quickly. Um, we also saw that, and this goes back to Dave's point that he made earlier, that even among Latinos who were not terribly religious, there was a real emphasis in conversations about marriage on the religious dimensions of marriage. Um, there was also some confusion among, among some of the folks with whom we talked about why same-sex couples would want to marry in, 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 in the first place. There were some folks who volunteered questions about, you know, why wouldn't it just be enough to have a will or a contract of, 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 of some kind. And once the conversation really got focused on the sort of rights and benefits conversation, 
it was very difficult to bring people back to talking about marriage. Folks really wanted to get stuck on talking about wills and contracts and so on and so forth. And so in developing a framework for more persuasive and more effective conversations with Latino audiences about marriage, we focus on two things. And I, the next few slides are going, are going to be fairly text heavy. Please don't worry about trying to jot everything down. We're actually going to provide a link to a publication at the end of our, our, our briefing that has all of this content and quite a bit, bit more in both Spanish and, and in English. <clears throat> but um, first off, we want to focus on shared values of family and fairness. And our, our core messages there are, number one, that every gay person is part of someone's family and should be treated with compassion and respect. And number two, as, as Monica mentioned, the golden rule. I believe in treating others as I would want to be treated, and that allow, includes allowing gay couples to marry. The other piece of this, is, though, is that we want to illustrate the harms, primarily emotional harms, of denying marriage to gay and lesbian couples. And we kind of talk about that by emphasizing that marriage denial makes it hard for gay couples to take care of each other, that no member of anyone's family, gay or straight, should be denied the chance at happiness in marriage. And going back to what, what, what Monica was talking about with, with regard to focusing on family, emphasizing that family unity and, and, and the support that comes with family and, 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 and the happiness that, that really comes with being able to marry the person you, you love. So we're actually going to take a couple of slides and, 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 and look in depth at a couple of these concepts. Again, don't worry about writing all of this down. But the idea that every gay person is part of someone's family was such a critical conversation piece. You know, um, emphasizing that every gay person is someone's son or daughter, someone's brother or sister, cousin, aunt, uncle. Naming those relationships in our conversations really helped connect folks with the gay people that they knew in their lives and made their desire for marriage and their desire to make that kind of, of, of a commitment a family priority. It also made protecting a person against discrimination in marriage a family priority and not an individual one or one that was kind of focused on, 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 on the idea of rights. As Monica mentioned a couple of slides ago, we, we, we did, and thanks to the terrific research by Ben Dixon and Amandi International, we also had a chance to take a look at Latino support for for marriage, and as I mentioned, you know it, it it is it is very good and very in keeping with with the population as a whole in the U.S. Fifty percent of Latino respondents in our survey voiced support for civil marriage or matrimonio civil for gay and lesbian couples, with only 44 percent opposed. I would also note that this this, this poll was taken um, just a little under two years ago, and as we have seen growth in general public opinion and support of marriage since since then we would expect that we would see similar um, uh, tr uh, tracking of growth among, among Latino and Hispanics now in 2012. We also saw, and this is um, very important, that we also saw that 62% of Latino Catholic respondents voiced support for civil marriage or matrimonio civil. And so it's kind of thinking about this from a perspective of values and, and religious and faith values in particular, the idea of treating others as I would want, want to be treated and, and loving one's, one's neighbor really were such important conversations to bring to, to the table when talking about marriage. While the term golden rule itself doesn't really translate well into Spanish, it's kind of viewed as an Anglicism, the concept of, of treating others as I would want to be treated was such a persuasive and such a, a really impactful arg argument um, in, in favor of, 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 of support for marriage that that principle really drives quite a bit of, of, our, of our conversation on the issue as does a positive reinforcement of church's rights. A lot of times we will kind of talk about, um, you know, the impact of, of, of marriage on, on churches by saying things like, you know, churches won't be forced to marry, marry gay, gay couples, which is obviously true, and there are certainly robust constitutional protections um, that, 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 that do protect churches in this area. But we found that actually talking about it positively talking about the fact that allowing a gay couple to have a city hall marriage doesn't affect churches. This law protects the right of churches to decide who they will marry, and it also protects gay couples and their families 
positioning it positively was actually very, very helpful. And of course, you know, an emphasis on matrimonio civil um, highlights the distinction between the civil and religious dimensions of marriage in, in ways that, that many of the folks we talked to found very helpful. Finally, we want to talk about the fact that no member of anyone's family, gay or straight, should be denied the chance of happiness in, in, in marriage. You know, the message that's over there in the green box on the left, I won't, I won't read it in its entirety, but it talks about, and it's from, from the perspective of, of, uh, of a man who's been married to his wife for 40 years, and it talks a little bit about the values of, of marriage, talking about the lifelong promise and the happiness that that lifelong promise has brought to their lives evoking those shared values, talking about love and commitment and that promise, really reminds people of what marriage is all about and why couples both gay and straight wish, wish to enter in, into marriage. It also focuses on how wrong it is to deny someone that fundamental form of, of, of fairness and, 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 and happiness. Um, we tested and um, we were able to, um, to, uh, to um, observe some, some research that was conducted in, in Oregon, again, um, you know, consulted with by Ben Dixon and Amandi International, and conducted by Basic Rights Oregon and by CAUSA, M M um, Oregon's immigrant rights org organization, looking at some of these, 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 these messages and kind of um, looking at how effective they were um, across a number of, of, of large, large radio markets in Oregon. So our next slide, and I'm going to pass the um, presentation back to, um, to Ben. And uh, we're actually going to play a couple of quick radio ads right now that were run in, in Oregon. The first ad that we will, we, we will be hearing was played for about two weeks. And then the second ad was played for about two and a half weeks. There's a little bit of overlap be, be, between the ads. And, and, and you'll also notice at the beginning of the, of the second ad um, kind of encapsulates the story from the first ad. Once we're done listening to those, we'll talk a little bit about what we found. We can't, I can't hear the ad at all. Just so people know, that was um, the audio comes through on your computer. So if we are going to play one more uh, multimedia thing, so if you do want, if any of you are having trouble hearing it, that's probably because this audio comes through on your computer, not on your phone, and you'll want to make sure to turn up the volume on your computers uh, for the next time that we do play a, a YouTube clip. And I will pass it back to Sean. To 
here and and weren't. Um, in the second ad, we'll we'll kind of start 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 with the positive finding. What we found in these ads is that talking about um, you know the fact that every gay person is part of someone's family. As a Latina, I believe in loving my neighbor and treating others the way that we would like to be treated, and in never turning our backs on family. And then the importance of not wanting any member of anyone's family, gay or straight, to be denied the chance of happiness in in marriage. Those. Um, those parts of the ads were very, very powerful and were very helpful in terms of moving conversations forward around marriage. Um, me. Um, so let's also kind of spend a moment, forgive me, talking a little bit about um, some, 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 some things that, that we would recommend based on our, on our experience here to avoid doing. Going back to the ads we just listened to, one of the things that we found is that the first ad that was all, all, all about the father um, did, was not as effective. And in part, it's because the, the ad kind of crossed a line in, into becoming just a little overly melodramatic. The other thing that it did, and I think that this is an important dis distinction and one of the things we hope to learn a little bit more, more about going forward, is that the family rejection narrative that the father was 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 sharing really is out of step with with Latino values. Um, the challenge is that by kind of presenting it and just kind of leaving it out out there, we we there may have been some some resistance to that. Whereas in the mother's story, even though there there is some initial rejection, there is reconciliation at that at the end, and the family is 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 whole again. And so we you know um, it's 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 probably worth thinking about whether or not the sorts of family rejection narratives normalize that rejection or place it as kind of outside of of of, of the norm and outside of the way that that Latinos and Hispanics view view family. Second, and this kind of moves off the ads, we want to avoid messages that directly engage with or focus attention on anti-LGBT attacks. You know, um, opponents are very fond of kind of trying to change the subject and make it about anything but, but marriage. But we would just really want to make sure that to the extent possible, we're focusing on the values of, of marriage when we're talking about marriage and also how much it hurts gay, gay couples to, to be denied marriage. We want to avoid talking about family and respect in ways that run counter to Latino cultural understandings of, of, of the terms. For example, it's often said with, within kind of more, more Anglo um, LGBT advocacy circles that love makes a family. The idea that one, yeah, a couple plus a child is what family is. Obviously, that's not um, a, a, um, you know, an accurate conceptualization of, of family from a Latino and, and, and Hispanic um, vantage point by and large. We also want to avoid discrimination comparisons between LGBT people and Latinos or between LGBT equality and immigration rights. One of the things that came across very clearly in, in, our, in, in our conversations is that those sorts of, con of, of comparisons are both um, not, 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 not well accepted because even though many Latinos do view, as Monica said, discrimination against gays and lesbians as, 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 as a real problem, um, trying to compare um, dis, the, the discriminations or in particular to kind of, kind of say that one form of discrimination is the same as another really is, is, is not effective and actually got, got, got folks a little bit resistant to the conversations. We want to avoid advancing LGBT people as spokespeople in isolation from their families. You know, the idea of just kind of putting a gay individual person out there to advocate on behalf of marriage or or any issue is not as helpful as kind of placing that 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 gay or lesbian person in in in, in the context of and surrounded by the, by their family, which also kind of sends that message about family acceptance. We also want to avoid attacks on religious beliefs, churches, and faith leaders. Faith is such an important part of many Latinas' lives, and it, you know, um, saying saying things that 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 seem like they are anti-religious, anti-faith faith leader, really it it, it it does not help us with any audience at, at, at all, and and can be quite a um, kind of a stumbling block and an obstacle toward productive conversations with 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 Latinas. I'm now going to turn it back over to Monica. OK. 
Okay, first now we're just going to go a little bit into what we've done with some of this research and what we hope to do in the future as well. Um, as you can imagine, we've all felt pretty positive and been very excited about the findings and the conversations we've had. So the next steps have been to make sure that these messages are actually a useful living tool that helps our community move forward, right? In order to do that, we've outreached to Latino leaders to make sure that they know about the findings and that they can reflect that in their own conversations, privately and publicly. You know, for years, as Dave mentioned earlier, you could, it was very common to hear, oh, you know, Latinos are not open to supporting LGBT issues. Oh, you know, we don't talk about that. Or Latinos are homophobic, even. Well, we couldn't disagree more. And so we're reaching out to make sure that our leaders have a, a more accurate and updated picture of how our community actually feels about their gay and lesbian friends, family members, and colleagues. Um, we're also using these messages in earned media to drive uh, greater acceptance among Latinos. So, for example, here at GLAD, we make sure that whenever we train anybody to be a spokesperson, that they have the tools, the messaging tools, and that they understand to speak to the themes that underlie that support. A couple of uh, recent examples, we worked with Rua Gonzalez of NCLR who wanted to write a piece about his wedding. And we worked with him on it and included great messages about his family and family acceptance in general. So it was personal, but it was also about, it reflected some of these findings about what we hear about family acceptance. And that was in AOL Latino and, and Huffington Post both. We worked with Lourdes Rodriguez uh, Nogues of Dignity, who was asked to do an interview. Um, the CNN in Espanol called us and they wanted someone to talk about the Pope and some messages some, some things the Pope had said about marriage. So Lourdes went on there and talked about her faith, and again, a personal, wonderful interview, but also she talked about how faith is not a barrier to acceptance for a lot of people, not just for herself, but for others. Um, a third, we're also making sure that media decision makers and, and personalities are aware of the support among Latinos for gay people and issues, because we don't want them out there also framing their discussions from a point of view of, oh, you know, there's no, there's no support there, when in fact there is a lot of support. Um, and then finally, of course, we're working with the LGBT and the broader progressive community to expand our outreach. Let me um, finally point you to a really important resource that what we've been talking about is the, you know, the Talking About um, series, and we have a wonderful resource online, uh, as you can see here, www.lgbtmap.org slash Talking About series, and you can download that. It's in English and Spanish, but um, I'm always available, Sean is as well, to have any kind of conversation with you about it. Uh, just to talk about it, in, or if you want to use some of it, and if you're going to do an interview or what have you, in English or Spanish. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure sharing these findings with you. And I'm not sure who, I think I'm passing to Thalia. Is that right? Yeah, uh, this is Sean. I think your line may still be muted. Hi, every Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. This is Sally of the Pados. I am the Director of Public Education at Freedom to Marry, and I specialize in public education and messaging work. So you can imagine that when we heard the outcomes of this research, we were incredibly excited about it and really wanting to help um, push forward and take it to the next step, which was really to help create some easy to use materials for public education and dissemination that would be useful in Latino and Hispanic communities. So we started out really talking with Dave Montez, reaching out to some other leaders, and engaging some highly credible consultants who are high profile Latina lesbians themselves who are well known and well respected, Laura Esquivel, Ingrid Duran, and Catherine Pino. And together uh, they came up with the concept of a campaign title, Familia es Familia, and the idea that, you know, it's time for us to talk. It's time to get this conversation started in a broad way. So in reaching out to have discussion, it was certainly clear from the beginning that we needed to have an effort that was a bilingual campaign. 
raising a conversation in ways that were respectful and really taking, just directly taking the kinds of messages that came from the research. So no member of anyone's family should face discrimination. Every gay or lesbian person is part of someone's family, someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, cousin, aunt, or uncle, as Sean was just describing, taking those materials and really making them into materials that would be easy to use, to pass along, and to share. So you can see the messages go from a broader family acceptance. They include the anti-bullying messages and then move, you know, really to marriage and including marriage as a part of a broad series of conversations that need to take place. In order to really make this campaign happen, Laura and the team started by reaching out to leaders of major Hispanic national organizations. First to share the data and really, I think, encourage and show how the research can be so helpful in finding ways to educate and, and just do that respectful engagement to their constituencies. And they have found so far um, five national organizations have signed on as partners in Familia is Familia. Those are Maldef, LULAC, NCLR, LACLA, and the National Puerto Rican Coalition. And discussions are currently underway with another five organizations. Next, looking at state level partnerships and opportunities, the needs are arising very quickly. As everyone know, in, knows in Maryland, with the DREAM Act being on the ballot, at the same time that marriage for same-sex couples will be voted on, it's really important to have cross-community education and dialogue. So these materials will be made useful there. In other states like Washington State, I mean, there's a number of states this year that are really top level for having this kind of conversation. And then with local partners, many of the national groups, of course, have local chapters or some other local presence, and they can share the materials throughout the organizations to really stimulate conversation at whatever level is most useful. In terms of products, uh, there's lots of things under discussion right now. Of course, printed materials will be one of the first things developed. Radio ads utilizing the learning from the research that Monica and Sean just shared. Creating additional videos with real life stories. Creating a centralized web resource that's a place where anyone can go and grab onto materials, download and print things so that workshops can be presented at national conferences, speakers for programs and panels, the opportunity to provide in-service programs to educate staff or boards of directors, kind of meeting organizations where they are. And it's really, there's no cookie cutter approach. It's meeting groups where they are and helping them take the next step in order to reach the widest possible swath of the many Latino communities. So we're incredibly excited about what feels like unprecedented access and this opportunity to move forward in a way that can really be impact impactful in the long term. Uh, we're you know, really looking to expand the partnerships to build out plans for infrastructure and kind of rolling out this campaign. Right now, you know, we're in the design phase and we're currently seeking resources to actualize this opportunity and really put all these pieces together so that allies and champions of LGBT equality among the mainstream Latino organizations will really have the materials that they need to do the outreach. And I'll just close by saying that one key element to the success of this public education effort is that Familia as Familia will not be identified with any single organization. It will be branded as its own public education campaign so that every group that joins in partnership can own it and feel like they have equal access and ownership. I think we found in some of our experience in other public education activities, as soon as one organization owns something, then others tend to fall back and, and pull back a little bit and not feel like they can take advantage. So by creating something neutral, everyone can join, everyone can take advantage and utilize the terrific research and materials. 
Great. So I will turn it back to Francis then. Thank you so much. Um, before uh, introducing our next speaker, Axel Caballero, I'd like to briefly um, uh, give Ben the floor. Ben. Great. Thanks, Francis. Sure. Um, so uh, I just want to say a couple of, of thank yous to folks who have made this webinar possible. This is a brief commercial break. Um, the thanks to funders for LGBTQ issues, uh, our sister affinity group, which has uh, really been a trailblazer for racial equity issues in LGBT communities. Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, the Gill Foundation, represented here by Dave, uh, the Open Society Foundation, and the Arcus Foundation, all of which have supported HIP's uh, work on LGBT Latino issues at various points. Um, and that's the thank you to all of our panelists for all of the great work that you're doing and presenting here today and for, uh, for being part of this work. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, I also want to encourage uh, listeners uh, to please send us your questions through the chat function uh, at the end of the, of the formal presentations and, and questions that I'll be uh, forwarding to them. We will have uh, time to incorporate your questions uh, to, uh, you know, directed at the panel. So uh, moving to uh, Axel Caballero is uh, founder and director of Cuéntame, a digital video storytelling project at the Brave New Foundation, and he'll be going to he'll be talking about some of the projects that he's been doing there. Thank Axel? you. Yes, thank you, Francis. Um, so let me tell you a little uh, quick introduction about Cuéntame. Uh, Cuéntame, we we. As, as most of you know, means uh, tell me your story or count me in. And that is precisely what we aim to do, uh, which is to tell stories that really mobilize our community and to have our voices heard and to have our voices counted through those stories. Uh, we've covered multiple issues from arts, cultures, to immigration, to pushing back against hate speech. And we started uh, uh, realizing that uh, most of our supporters, being 18 to 35, uh, started voicing the need to develop a similar uh, documentary series uh, around LGBT issues within the Latino community. Uh, they began talking about their own personal stories, about their own uh, families, and and you know we realized that that's that that we needed to engage into that conversation that we needed to bring uh, those stories into light and do it in in such a way that would promote a very personal connection and interaction and that's precisely how a, an honest conversation uh, was born it was born uh, as a need as a series uh, to to engage into in that conversation in a sober and very direct manner in a way where individuals would connect uh, intergenerationally and talk about these issues uh, in a direct manner in an inspirational manner and most important to highlight the instances of triumph uh, which is often the case goes unnoticed of how many of these stories overcame a lot of the different challenges and how these challenges uh, were, were overcome by, by our individuals. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to let the clip, one of the clips uh, of an honest conversation uh, play. And in this clip, we're going to see Giselle, who tells us her personal story, uh, how she came about uh, in, in succeeding uh, and facing adversity, and really talking about all the main issues that we've talked in the previous slide, uh, which is how family uh, uh, plays an important part of it. So, so I'll let the, the clip play and then um, talk a little bit about what we just saw.
I think you need to unmute the line so that people can talk. So basically that uh, was one of our uh, our first clip, our first uh, clip in a series of five or six different videos. Uh, and the way that we approach particularly production and distribution on these was uh, to very straightforward, to have a direct conversation, to try to minimally edit these pieces, uh, to have them bilingual, which, which presented a huge, huge, huge uh, advantage in, in messaging here. Uh, particularly, we have a story of, a, of, a, of another parent who, uh, upon seeing some of our videos and, and talking about these issues, both uh, subtitled and in Spanish, uh, said that that impacted her because, you know, there was another way for her to talk about these issues within her own family. And that's precisely what we wanted to do. We wanted to connect these stories to a larger issue, to talk uh, particularly on all these different t uh, topics. And our message was simple, uh, natural storytelling, shareable personal connections, incorporating uh, those uh, segment pieces into what social media does best, which is our main platform, and that is to engage in those conversations. Uh, our ask within those videos, every video has a particular ask, is, is also uh, very simple and direct, and it, that just take part of the conversation. We just wanted people to talk about it, to grab those videos, post on their networks, and ask questions around it, and, and begin talking about that with their own networks and their own community. And we involved, in, in, for distributions, parents, teachers, organizations, and other individuals, so asked for them to also take that to their own constituents and networks and use these videos, these segments, as a way to engage in that conversation. Uh, and we also wanted to impact the national narrative. We wanted to, to create that conversation beyond the social media space and also allow for other outlets and media uh, to take these videos and to engage in that uh, conversation as well. And uh, we, we, were, we promoted those videos with Huffington Post, who cross-posted on both gay voices and Latino voices, uh, as well as L'Opinion, who, who uh, uh, engaged in those conversations as well in Spanish. And so that's a little bit of, of what an honest conversation aimed to do, and now we want to take the next level, which is to join all these four, five, six stories and create a full length, uh, uh, about 30, 45 uh, minute feature uh, film that we can then take uh, to screenings across the country. Thank you. Thanks so much, Axel. So to conclude, uh, this part of the, of the presentation is Dave Montes uh, will provide a funder's perspective on the general question that we've been talking today. Dave? Thank you, Francis, um, and thank you, everyone, for um, your excellent presentations. And so, I mean, the question that I was told to answer is why is this strategic um, and why, why should funders be considering work like this? Um, and I go back to what I said at the beginning, which was, um, first of all, it's what the field was asking for. Um, and I think um, as foundations, we need to be responsive to what um, people in the field need, um, tools that uh, people in the field are asking for. And, and I think um, it also has shaped um, the strategy for the work that we're doing. So, I mean, if, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we were talking, we kept hearing um, multiple um, sides of the same issue that, you know, religion was a major factor in the way that, uh, especially Catholicism and the way that LGBT, uh, Latinos felt about LGBT issues. And from this research, it shows that, in fact, Catholicism isn't that much of a contributing factor. Um, and so that sort of shaped um, the way that we did, uh, that we um, formed the strategy for um, the alliance building work that we do between LGBT um, and Latino organizations. Um, the second thing that it informed us about is that um, Latinos are already largely supportive of many of the issues that LGBT advocacy organizations are already working on. Um, and that where the particular focus needed to be is on um, public education around relationship recognition. And so a lot of the work, um, the public education work that we're doing is marriage specific. 
um, that we're funding is marriage specific. Although there is opportunity around non-discrimination, as you saw from uh, from the from the numbers that uh, um, Monica and Sean presented. So um, that's for us um, why we decided to do this work and why we decided to invest um, in this research, um, both to um, shape our own internal strategy, but also to be responsive to the field. Francis, is there, is there other specific questions you want me to answer? Well, I have uh, some questions, uh, so um, I'm thinking that uh, I'll start with those um, general questions um, and then move to the floor, so to speak. Um, the first is you ended on this question of strategy. Um, I'd like to maybe start with one that uh, addresses that. Um, there's been a number of studies that suggest that Latino, uh, LGTB Latinos in particular, are very concerned about issues of discrimination, poverty, access to resources. Uh, but these tend to be issues that there's next to no messaging around. Um, there's much more messaging to issues that seem to be very central to, uh, for lack of a better term, mainstream LGBT uh, community. So my question is, how are the priorities around messaging established in your organization? I mean, not only Dave, but in general, anybody that wants to answer. Uh, are, and are these choices a matter of funding that's available or strategy or all of the above or some other reason? Um, I'll start. I mean, I think uh, it's a it's a fair question, and um, thank you for bringing it up. I mean, as you saw, I mean, some of you know, I mean, whether or not LGBT Latinos are being fired from their jobs, um, you know, obviously leads to has an economic impact. Or being fired from their jobs for being gay obviously has an economic mm -hmm. impact. Um, and and I think that um, the marriage conversation in general is sort of dominating the airwaves, not because necessarily any work that we're doing, but it's just the hot button issue of the moment. And so, um, th you know, um, marriage uh, provides opportunity for economic security, um, especially for gay and lesbian couples that are um, um, have children. Um, but so it's not like, we didn't decide that um, marriage was the highest priority. I mean, the research said that um, marriage was where we needed to do the most education, and then compounded by by that research was that marriage was the hot button topic that everyone was talking about in the media. Um, but I'd like to hear from uh, Monica, Sean, and Thalia about that as well. Absolutely. Uh, you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, definitely, as Dave mentioned, you know, conversations are driven to a great degree by media, and, and media is reacting to whatever is happening, court decisions, um, decisions in different countries to legalize marriage and so forth. So a lot of times that's where, where the conversation comes from, and so we have to react in terms of training folks. But we definitely are glad we work hard to make sure that folks talk about the entirety of their lives whether it's, you know, what job they do, what work they do, what their immigration status, and, and as well that they are, that they're conscious of the fact that other Latinos are dealing with issues like immigration, like being, you know, raids at their workplace, et cetera, et cetera, so that we always make sure that when we're preparing folks that they understand the issues in other people's lives as well and can be sensitive to that and not sort of act as if the LGBT issues are the only issues on people's minds. Um, we trained some, some immigration dreamers, um, immigration activists, dreamers, young dreamers who were getting an award in Chicago, and, and, um, and they've been doing media since then, continuing to do media, and, and doing exactly what you, you know, are referring to, Francis, talking about their, their issues around, their issues and the issues that other people face around immigration, around poverty, and so forth, and as well being out while they talk about that. Um, you know, and again, to, to sort of bring folks make it clear that, that it's an entirety. There are a lot of things that were that are part of our lives. Right. Is um, there anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, you know, and um, what I'm about to, to, to discuss isn't isn't a, a kind of a messaging document, but um, at the Movement Advancement Project, you know, messaging is kind of one, one part of what we do. Another part, which has actually been a significant focus of our work in the past year, is on policy research. And um, you know, for for folks who are who are who are, who are kind of in interested in looking at kind of how kind of unfair laws kind of affect 
um, L LGBT families more, more, more broadly. We are in the process of, of doing kind of a year-long rollout of a report called All Children Matter, How Legal and Social Inequalities Hurt Children with LGBT Parents. Mm -hmm. And part of that report, actually a very substantial part of that report, is looking at kind of economic security and looking at how safety net programs fail families with with, with LGBT parents and, and, and with children. We actually just published uh, two reports, one on like, focusing on economic security and safety net programs, and one that also looks, um, focuses particularly on families of, of, of color, including Latino and, and Hispanic families, and, 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 and looking at the ways that poverty negatively uh, affects um, unique challenges around adoption, um, gaps in terms of, of you know, dis disparities in terms of, of uh, being able to secure health insurance. And so, yeah, there, there, there are some really terrific resources out, out, out there that can very easily kind of be used to inform a lot of the messaging and a lot of the prioritization of some of these discussions. Yeah, this Thank is you. Thalia. I, I yeah. was just going to add briefly that um, the census data now is showing that the largest percentage is of same-sex couples raising children are couples of color, Latino and African-American couples. So yeah, their access to resources, to all the things Sean was just talking about, they are people who are really struggling to, to provide for their children. Um, so another, another question that I had had to do with um, Latino LGBT or organizations or groups uh, within this um, um, set of, of conversations and collaborations that are taking place uh, between LGBT and Latino organizations or LGBT organizations that are uh, targeting uh, Latinos uh, with different messages. So I wondered, uh, is this like an underutilized resource, uh, Latino LGBT organizations themselves uh, don't seem to be very represented or not an essential part of these conversations. Um, this is this is Dave. I'll I'll jump in yeah. on that one. So I, I mean I think um, so when we started this so this messaging project was entirely done by a Latino organization. I mean Ben Nixon and Amandi's staff is almost entirely Latino. Um, and when we started it, Glad Jared Barrios was the head of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, but. To answer your question more specifically, um, I do think that Latino LGBT organizations have a role to play in this conversation, in this dialogue. Um, I think um, part of what the LGBT movement has struggled with is a lack of resources even for mainstream LGBT organizations. And so if you look at LGBT Latino organizations, Many of them are social service organizations. Many of them are arts and culture organizations. And there are very few um, that have sort of advocacy capacity to engage in a large-scale public education program. Um, so part of what the, the strategy that we have taken here at the Gill Foundation because of that um, is, and because of our limited resources, is to partner with um, Latino organizations that are not LGBT, um, that have um, LGBT staff, LGBT leadership, um, and a desire to do more LGBT work. Um, but as I mentioned before, it would be great if we could um, come up with resources as a movement or even beyond the LGBT movement into the mainstream Latino movement um, to fund some of these under-resourced um, LGBT Latino organizations to partner with the mainstream LGBT organizations and then the straight Latino organizations to do some of this work because, because I think it's going to take all three um, right. working in unison in order to achieve what we're really after here. I think this is Ben from HIP. Uh, I, Dave and I have had some great conversations about how we do need all of these things working in tandem. And it definitely is a challenge that a lot of the LGBT Latino organizations just uh, tend to be smaller in both budget size and most are unstaffed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why one of HIP's strategies and the strategy, a strategy that we've seen work is providing capacity building support for LGBT Latino organizations so that they can, you know, develop a better policy capacity 
or even just strengthen the board so that, or strengthen fundraising capacity so that the groups are more sustainable um, and better able to have ongoing partnerships uh, on campaigns like this. Um, this is Monica, if I can jump in real quick on it. Um, we've been lucky in Los Angeles, we have Latino Equality Alliance, I think they're on the call today, and we've been able to work really closely with those folks and to talk about, you know, when they, whenever they do interviews and pitching them and so forth, and to, in order to incorporate these messages. And, um, and as well as uh, here in LA, Promotoras, which is a part of Planned Parenthood, had us come in and talk about, train, I'm going to say about 30 of their uh, promotoras who go out in the community to talk to Latinos about different issues, and they wanted to talk about family acceptance, so we were able to, to do that. So one of the things we'd love to do is to go um, to other states and, and train the organizations in those states, because they are smaller, as you, as you both have mentioned, as, as Ben, and they've mentioned they're usually often smaller and are not able um, to, you know, we, we'd have to go, we have to go to them, and part of our goal for next year is to do more of that, is to travel to different states and train the folks in those Latino organizations to work with these messages. Thanks so much. Is there anyone that, uh, I'm starting actually to get uh, questions from, uh, from listeners, so uh, I don't know, Ben, are you getting any questions from listeners? Yeah, we are, and if, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to chat them in. You can chat them to me at, because uh, Ben Sintelendipi is the host up there at the top, um, and you just click chat just like with IMing, and we'll be happy to try to answer them. One initial question we have is sort of a, a basic backstage question that I thought Thalia might be able to answer as our resident marriage equality expert. Um, Alejandro asks that marriage in California you know, given that we have or could have marriage in some states, such as California, Massachusetts, and a number of others, does that or could it make it possible for uh, one partner to seek citizenship if, say, one partner is from Mexico and the other is uh, a U.S. citizen? Would it make be possible uh, for the, the Mexican partner to get citizenship just as uh, heterosexual married couples do? Sure. Happy to talk about that. Um, some folks are familiar with DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, which is the federal law that actually prohibits uh, citizenship rights for same-sex married couples. However, because of the growth in support for marriage, for a lot of work that's been done with the Obama administration, they've essentially started first with some individual cases, but now they've started to say more broadly that they're not going to seek out um, for deportation, couples who are same-sex couples who otherwise would have been protected through marriage. So they seem to be indicating at a pretty wide level that they're going to turn their attention away from same-sex couples and not deport um, couples after some a few high-profile cases were really brought to attention, got some media coverage, etc. So it's not out of the woods yet, and we have a lot of work to do to actually overturn DOMA. But for now, we're starting to see a little bit of easing off of the federal government in their attention around this question. This is, this is Dave. I wanted to jump in also. I think there's also a, a second avenue. So um, with comprehensive immigration reform potentially moving, depending on what happens in November, I mean, I think there's an opportunity to include protections for gay and lesbian binational couples um, in the comprehensive immigration reform package. Um, so, I mean, I, I would encourage anyone on the call to reach out to their state-based um, immigration organization or LGBT organization, for that matter, and start to talk about what can be done um, to ensure that um, comprehensive immigration reform packages um, that are voted on in the next legislative session are, in fact, inclusive of gay and lesbian binational couples. So that's the second avenue. Great. I have two questions in, uh, let's just someone that wants to follow up on this uh, one uh, question that we're uh, talking about. Okay. Uh, well, one is from uh, Laura Civil, uh, who is talking about one of the things that has been working against Latinos on the issue is the conventional wisdom that Latinos are more socially conservative, so therefore it's even harder for Latinos to come out to their families. And she's, she's asking, uh, can we take a, a little time to discuss why it's important to avoid reinforcing this uh, in our own education efforts since that's been debunked through this and other research? Um, anyone want to uh, uh, answer to that or comment on that? 
Um, yeah, this is Monica. I, hear, I can only say yes, yes, yes. Absolutely important to counter that. I mean, I remember that um, uh, we got a call right away on in 2008, right after the election, uh, when Prop 8 um, in California, when we we lost the right to marry. And right away, I got a call. I think you know, 11:30, 12 o'clock, when the returns were in, from the Associated Press. And she said, well, I've already talked to Sam Rodriguez, and he said that Prop 8 passed because of Latinos. Um, so, you know, that's clear that Latino support, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, um, a lot of folks will definitely reinforce that message every chance they get that Latinos are not open. And so it's important for us to show the truth, which is, you know, what we talked about today, what the research shows, what polls show, et cetera, that tell, that tell the true story. Um, so I think that is I think that is wonderful to remind folks, and you know whenever possible, you know we we try to get folks to to actually say those words. You know Latinos are supportive of LGBT issues. You know it, there sometimes there is some difficulty and and worry around telling your family, talking about families because you perceive them to be uncomfortable around talking about sexuality. But once that conversation happens, um, there's a lot of support among families. And we see that anecdotally. We've seen it. Many of us are lucky in, to have seen that in our own families. And people I've talked to around the country say that to me. They say, oh my gosh, you know that is so true. I thought my mother would never accept me. Or my, my partner's family who owns a little religious shop in Mexico City, this woman told me. She said, and, and they love me like a daughter-in-law. You know, So we see it anecdotally, and now we see it in the research as well. Yeah, and I can't. I guess on on that one example of Prop 8, I can't say enough about research because the minute uh, the, the immediate response was that because that's what the knee-jerk response. But when you looked at the numbers and you broke the, them down, for instance, you saw that for instance, young Latinos voted pretty much the same as as white Lati uh, whites, uh, for instance. And so it wasn't how people thought it was. So that's like I guess a uh, uh, a call for more support for doing research that challenges uh, what people have come to think is common sense, uh, which is not yeah. necessarily true. Th this is yeah, those messages, sorry, those messages, they just really have power. They last for years. You know, four years later, 2012, I'm just not now not getting a question from media. Well, okay, we know Latinos are anti-gay, so, and here comes the question, like, wait a minute, back it up. <laughs> no, hold on a minute. And they say, well, because of Prop 8. They say, well, no, actually. So, you know, once you get a message out there, it sticks. Um, so, right. you know, exactly. we all I, know that. I think the other the other side of that coin, though, is anything we can do to dispel myths that um, white LGBT people are not supportive of comprehensive immigration reform, which is also not true. Um, I, when Senate Bill 1070 passed in Arizona, um, Harris Interactive did a poll, um, a nationwide poll, to figure out how people felt about Senate Bill 1070, um, which, for those on the call that don't know, was sort of the anti-immigrant state legislation in Arizona. Um, that 60 percent of those polled uh, actually agreed with Senate Bill 1070, but they also did an LGBT subsample of that and found that 60 percent of LGBT people were actually opposed to Senate Bill 1070, and I think something like um, close to 50 percent were strongly opposed to Senate Bill 1070. So. Um, and as um, we hear from the field from our LGBT organizations that the more they do um, around um, around uh, immigration reform um, and pushing back against some of the um, anti-immigrant stuff at the state level, um, there is still some grumbling, obviously, I mean, you know, uh, but that, that largely what they're getting is sort of positive reinforcement um, of the work that they're doing. So. Um, I think it's important to dispel both myths at the same time. Mm -hmm. yep. This is yeah, Valio. And, and, go ahead. I was just going to jump in and say, so often with research, we sort of skip over the data and we move to the messages and we start trying to share and move the messaging. In this case, I think, as much as we can repeat the actual you know, numbers that mm -hmm. came out of this research, I think that's been a really important part of even reaching out to heads of organizations, of mainstream Latino organizations is, hey, look at these numbers. You're not going to be way out on the end of a limb on, on your own here. You're actually just taking advantage of a, a pretty broad-based level of support and raising the, the discussion to a higher level. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, 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 and this is Sean, and just, and just to follow up with Thalia, it's also a matter as well as kind of at looking at some of the even more recent public opinion numbers. I mean, just a couple that I'm familiar with, you know, the field poll in California, we were just talking about Prop 8, uh, did a survey, in, I think it was last, last month, and found that um, um, support for, for, for marriage in California um, among Latinos is now 53%. Um, you know, NBC News, the Wall, Wall Street Journal did a poll in February as well, finding support for marriage was was 55 percent among Latinos. That was a smaller sample size, but yeah, just kind of like making sure that there is kind of the steady drumbeat about the fact that there 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 is strong support, and and to Dave's point as well about making sure that that's not just about marriage. That, that that's also about the strength of the LGBT community's support for issues that are important to not only Latinos and Hispanics, but kind of a, a, kind of a broad range of, of, uh, of Americans like immigration rights. Um, ben and I seem to be getting a lot of questions about um, small groups that want to know what's next. Uh, one is from Anthony Ross uh, in California working with youth organizations uh, and wondering what are the tools and messages that we can pass on to these youth to be able to communicate better with their families. And then there's more general questions about how can uh, people participate in these campaigns and what's the work, uh, what can small groups contribute and move forward with, with those things that are already in progress. Hi, this is Axel Caballero. Yes. And I wanted to talk to, uh, about the, those tools uh, and particularly what we're seeing, you know, from the response uh, from the videos uh, that we put together is that uh, centering around uh, personal experience and personal stories and engaging in that dialogue to get ideas on how to talk about uh, the, those particular issues that are more prominent to Latino youth uh, is, has been an effective way for a lot of people to uh, to talk about. In fact, when we first uh, pushed forth the, the, the first five, uh, four videos, uh, we got an enormous amount of, of feedback as far as other stories and other individuals uh, that either had used the videos to talk uh, themselves about their own personal case or or, or just uh, their perspective and their own uh, story to uh, to kind of uh, participate in that in that uh, dialogue uh, I think that that using those you know main stories to drive those larger issues is an effective way for Latino youth organizations and uh, you know we're we're also looking uh, uh, for more more uh, partnership opportunities with uh, with organizations uh, in California and, and, and in other states to uh, to uh, partake and participate in these uh, type of screenings and panels per se, uh, where we would present maybe a video to talk about a particular issue, and then uh, a panelist would probably talk about their own work. The the partner would talk about their own work uh uh based reports and messaging points that they could uh push forward so uh so let me know of course uh you know if anyone is interested um uh, anyone want to comment on how uh groups and people can join the work that's already in progress Well, this is Thalia. I know with a lot of the states that are feeling uh, the need to generate dialogue because something will be on the ballot, et cetera, um, we will be um, trying to produce some materials very quickly to meet those needs. And uh, we'll try and convene some conference calls or webinars just to make sure we're reaching out to the lead organizations in each of those states and, and make those materials available quickly. This is Monica, and um, I would say uh, for us the answer is media. If you're excited and you want to do, you want to get those messages out, you know, give me a call or an email, and we can help you. We can f help you figure out in your local community where you can write an op-ed, where you can pitch yourself as a as a potential radio or television interviewee. Um, we'll figure out what your story is that you want to tell, and uh, or members of your group or your organization, you know, who have a great story to tell. I'm sure they do. You know, most people do. And we can help you um, pitch it and also then help you p prepare for that interview in Spanish or English, too. Um, so, yeah, so media. If you're passionate, let's help you get that passion out there. Let's, let's get your voice heard. 
This is, <clears throat> this is Dave. I, I think that anything you can do, so, I mean, safe schools protections is something that everyone cares about. I mean, everyone wants kids to be safe in schools. Um, so any time that you can talk about the full range of what it means for kids to be safe in schools, including LGBT kids, including Latino kids, including African American kids, um, the better off the conversation is going to be. Um, you know, obviously immigration reform has a big LGBT component. Many of the dreamers are openly gay. Um, there's gay and lesbian binational couples. Um, the, tran the way that trans people are treated in, in, in detention is horrendous and, and often ten times worse than anyone else, than the already terrible um, um, uh, situation in detention systems. So, I mean, any time that you can be comprehensive about the way you talk about an issue to include an LGBT perspective, um, the more um, deep the conversation is going to go and the more people are going to have that sort of head moment where they tilt their head and go, oh, my God, I didn't even realize there were LGBT immigrants, um, which is why immigra immigration is an LGBT issue. So, or I didn't know, realize that, you know, gay kids were being bullied in school. Oh, my God, safe schools mean so much to so many different people. So, I mean, even just that slight um, um, uh, paradigm shift where you include LGBT issues um, in the conversations you're already having um, will go so far in getting people to understand that these issues are much more comprehensive than they get people think about. Uh, is there anyone? I guess we have uh, Ben and I would wanted to forward one more question, unless there's someone that wants to uh, uh, comment on this last one before we wrap. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, so I guess our, our last question is: um, Everyone that's spoken today is pretty much focused on fairly concrete campaigns with very well-defined specific goals. So, what we're wondering is. How do you see these campaigns connecting to broader, more long-term movement building? Um, well, I mean, I think, so I mean, if you look at um, what um, people say about the LGBT community as far as size goes, I mean, the, you know, it's not really the 10% that people think. It's more along the lines of 4%. Um, if you uh, trust the Williams Institute data um, on, you know, where, how many people, how many LGBT, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people make up the U.S. population. And so we're not going to be able to achieve anything on our own. I mean, and, um, and so we need to be building these alliances and having these conversations um, in order to build a movement um, that isn't just made up of LGBT people, that is really made up of um, um, all progressive issues working together toward a common goal. So uh, the, 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 whatever starts the conversation, is whatever issue or coming out or whatever it is that, that starts the conversation is important, but continuing that conversation is going to um, make the movement so much stronger. This is Axel again. I think I think one powerful step has been how to talk and 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 particularly uh, open up that dialogue within the Latino community. So I think the next step is is bringing the Latino community into the larger question of how do we connect uh, those issues that that we've been talking about and that that uh, change or not necessarily change but a shift in paradigms uh, that we've been discussing and bringing it to the national landscape. And I think uh, the importance will be in focusing on particular battles and particular fights uh, that are that are worth uh, uh, tackling on and mobilizing uh, the the folks that we've already engaged uh, within the Latino community into partaking, uh, which is the next uh, I think step uh, 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 as far as the national uh, scope goes. Movement building. This is totally a closing. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to agree and say I think that. Given the, the issues that are at the forefront this year, there's a, a huge opportunity to, to really do cross-community organizing around immigration issues as well as marriage and the sort of broader range of LGBT issues. So, you know, we're looking forward to really encouraging that everywhere we go. So we are at the edge of our hour here at 329. Um, 
So I'm just going to turn it over to Ben to close. Thank you, everyone, for a very insightful uh, webinar and to all our engaged uh, listeners sending us questions. Uh, ben, do you want to have final word? Yes, thank you, Francis. Um, so just we've been getting some questions about having some of these resources available. And I just want to let everyone know that we will be uh, sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered. Um, and that will include uh, as many resources as we can fit in as possible, certainly all the ones you've seen referred to here, and perhaps some others that our, our panelists have recommended uh, in the chat session. Um, so you'll be getting all of those, and we hope that they're useful. We also have recorded this webinar, and we'll make that available as well. Um, also, as you log out, you will uh, get a link to a SurveyMonkey survey. And if you can, take just five minutes to fill out that survey. That helps us uh, try to be ever improving and make the next one even better. Um, and I guess to close, I just want to thank, uh, thank you to Francis for moderating and uh, helping facilitate a great discussion. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, I thought everything you said was really uh, thoughtful and also really refreshing because there is so much, um, to be honest, there's so much bad media <laughs> coverage of LGBT Latino issues. Um, it was great to just hear such rich data and um, such thoughtful engagement. And you know, my hope is that all of these messages, thanks to the presenters and to all of you on the call who are clearly eager to be part of this work, um, my hope is that you know these will be the messages that are dominating the airway uh, in the years to come. Um, and with that, I will just say thank you and hope you will join us at our next Hit Philanthropy Lab webinar. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.